CTV's W5. A loved one brutally slaughtered. It was the most horrific thing I ever seen. This was first degree murder, plain and simple. And the hunt for the killer brings shocking accusations. He was right under our nose that whole time. And I just felt so betrayed. It's unthinkable on so many levels. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. Imagine losing your mother in a vicious attack and then being accused, charged, and convicted in her murder. In this W5 One Hour Special, we investigate what is one of this country's most damning wrongful convictions. And yet, outside of St. John's, Newfoundland, few know the story of Greg Parsons. He's a man who lost his mother, his freedom, and at times, his will to live. Greg Parsons was just 19 years old when he made this 911 call. Come to 16 days, please. I was trying to get him touch my mother for two days. He found his mother dead in a pool of blood. She's up on the bathroom floor. Oh my God. Okay, is she breathing? Is your check? This tragic moment, just the beginning of a decades-long nightmare. I just peeked in the bathroom. There's blood everywhere. I don't know what happened. Newfoundland is known for its rugged beauty, painted houses, and fishing villages. What it's not known for is murder. <laughs> It's January 2nd, 1991. This is the actual audio of emergency crews as they race to 16 James Place with a warning from dispatch. A lady down in the bathroom, apparently it could be quite ugly. Over. There's the The crime was a, a horrific bloodbath. It was the most horrific thing I've ever seen. Are you seeing in your mind right now what you witnessed when you opened that door? I am. I'll never stop seeing it. Can you describe what you see? I can't recognize her face. And, and, and blood everywhere, covered. These crime scene photos document how a teenaged Greg Parsons found his mother behind her locked bathroom door, partially clothed, slashed, and stabbed 53 times. I ran down over the stairs, opened the front doors, screaming to Tina, she's dead, she's dead. Tina was Greg's 22-year-old girlfriend, now his wife of more than three decades. Every part of me now is shaking because I can remember it so vividly. It just made no sense. Greg's last contact with his mom was two days earlier on New Year's Eve. I spoke to her probably two minutes after 12 on New Year's Eve, and we told each other we loved each other and everything, and everyone says the last thing they'd like to say to their loved one is that they love them. And you got a chance to do I that. I got a chance to say it. But who would want 45-year-old Catherine Carroll dead? The RNC began investigating the stabbing of the woman last week. And the question was big news in the tight-knit community of St. John's. Carol lived alone in the dwelling and was divorced from her husband. The major crime section of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary hasn't released any new information today, just that its investigation into the murder of Catherine Carroll is continuing. It was the first murder that reporter Darren Bent ever covered, the details still vivid 32 years later. I was at the scene for a number of days covering what was going on there. They actually put a grid in place in the backyard and we assumed and speculated that they were looking for a weapon. It didn't take long for the news and for the gossip to spread, with whispers that maybe 19-year-old Greg had something to do with the crime. What was happening behind the camera in terms of the conversation in St. John's? Right from the get-go, 
at the scene that night. They thought it was strange the way Greg was acting, that he seemed cold. They never, never considered the fact that he might be in shock. He just found his mother. I think from that moment on, they weren't gathering evidence to solve the murder. They were gathering evidence to prove the case against Greg Parsons. Eight days after making that 911 call. There's blood everywhere. I don't know what happened. 19-year-old Greg Parsons went from grieving son to accused murderer. He came in and looked at me and he said, uh, Greg Parsons, you're under arrest for murder of Catherine Carl. And I, 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 it's, it's, it's just such a sinking feeling here. You're, you, you feel like you got absolutely no control. What's going through your mind? What are you thinking? Stop. Stop. Like, this is not right. When the woman's son was arrested, charged with murdering his own mother, you can imagine the shock waves that went through the town. With Greg in custody, the police interrogation went into overdrive and lasted for hours. They were trying to get a confession out of me. And what sorts of things were they saying to you? What kind of sick bastard would rape his mother and then kill her? In fact, there was no evidence of any sexual assault, but Greg Parsons, suspected murderer, was paraded from the police station to the lockup for his first night in custody. I was sick to my stomach. I didn't know what they were doing to him. I couldn't contact him. It's still, it's still really hard. On September 23rd, 1993, the first degree murder trial begins. A boyish looking Greg navigates his way through the throng of reporters, including Darren Bent. Over again. Witness after witness took that stand and identified problems in the relationship between Greg and his mom. What do you remember about that? Catherine Carroll would confide in a lot of people about trouble in the relationship she had with Greg. It just seemed like a lot of people had a lot to say. 45 witnesses testified in the five-month trial, all saying the same thing. Greg and his mom didn't get along. In the trial, you were painted as the evil son who, who, Absolutely. who your mother was scared of. Absolutely. They, they, they tried to paint a picture for the motive that it was a relationship triangle between mom wanting me back and, and Tina and, and myself. It was so bizarre. What evidence was presented at trial that linked you to the murder of your mother? Not a hair, not a fiber, not a fingerprint. 100% hearsay. There was no physical evidence linking you to the murder? Nothing. It was rumor? Rumor. In fact, the most damning piece of evidence came in the form of a cassette tape. On it, a song recorded with some of Greg's buddies during a jam session in his mom's basement a couple of years prior. Police learned about the song from one of Greg's childhood friends, Brian Doyle, who lived just steps away from the murder scene. I, I think they looked at it like it was some kind of motive. I was there when the song was recorded. I was there when the song was played. I was there when everybody was chipping in to write lyrics. And I was there when he played the song for his mother. She thought it was hilarious. She thought it was awesome that they actually had a song from start to finish. What was the name of the song? Kill Your Parents. It was a heavy, you know, uh, rock metalish type of sound to it, and it was kill your parents, kill your mother, kill your father, ha, 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 ha. This Kill Your Parents song to the crown was this smoking gun. Here in lyrics is evidence of a man who killed his mother. How did that play at trial? Oh, that, that, I think that was the devastating uh, moment in the trial uh, for uh, Greg Parsons. When that played, you could almost hear a pin drop afterwards in the courtroom. The jury deliberated for six days. 
and for six days, Tina prayed. When the jury was out, I went to the Basilica and I prayed. I prayed so much. And I dipped my arm in the holy water and I put it on gray and I said, God will protect us, we'll be fine. For the past five days, the jury in this first degree murder trial of Darren Bent covered this case from that first 911 call. He sat in court every day of the trial. February 15, 1994, three years after Catherine Carroll was murdered, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. Outside, away from the jury, have been the family members and supporters of Gregory Parsons. They've been waiting for the past five days. And today at noon, that wait came to an end. The jury came back with its verdict. Can you walk me through what the experience was like in that courtroom while you were waiting for the jury foreman to deliver the verdict? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, you, you, you could cut the air with a knife. It was, it was thick. It was a difficult thing to experience. Um, hey, what do you say? I'm sorry, I don't, I, I just, you know, I, do, I, I just don't want to be part of that. Can I ask you what, what's bothering you? Because of what I know now, what I knew afterwards, how wrong it was. So they said to the uh, jury, how do you find on first degree murder? Not guilty. Well, how do you find on second? Guilty. Greg, when you heard guilty, I felt like I was shot in the head. 20 police officers instantly showed up and started storming through the doors of the court. Because all oh, hell is breaking loose Because in the court. hell is breaking loose at the courthouse. What was Tina doing? Crying out for me, crying out my name. I was just trying to get Greg to let him to just hold him one last time to let him know that we were going to fight it, and I, I couldn't get to him. I was crying uncontrollably, and Greg could hear my screams echoing through the whole Supreme Court, calling for him. And uh, I just looked at the jury and I said, do you, you do not know what you've done. Do you know what you've done? With shocked family and friends weeping outside, Greg was whisked out of court and transferred to jail. Mr. Parsons, any comment on the uh, verdict? Is that... His lawyer, Robert Simmons, was clearly shaken by the verdict. Boys, I just need a little time to think about it. Uh, we're seriously considering an appeal, and I'm sure there will be an appeal. How's Mr. Parsons taking it? As the handcuffed Gregory Parsons was led from the courtroom this morning, he spoke publicly for the first time since being arrested. That was over three years ago. He said very calmly, I'm innocent. I lied on the bottom bunk, looking at the graffiti above me. This is your view for the rest of your life. Coming up. It's the ultimate betrayal. Beaten down by brutal accusations. They were torturing me. Torture me. When W5 continues. St. John's, Newfoundland. Close to downtown, there's a quiet, dead-end street, James Place. Everything on the James Place side hasn't changed. Greg Parsons grew up here at number 16. We were the first people to move into James Place. It wasn't even paved. I actually loved the neighborhood, and we played ball hockey, and we did, we all grew up poor, but I tell you, we grew up having fun, so I, I, I enjoyed the neighborhood. But life was tough, too. Greg's mom, Catherine Carroll, struggled with addiction and mental health issues throughout her life, and so Greg had to grow up fast. Basically, I became a man very young and uh, started my first business when I was 16, and, and that was to feed myself. It sounds as though life was really, really tough with your mom when you were, when you were a little guy. <sighs> It was. One of the biggest things was uh, food and uh, clothing. I was embarrassed to go to high school because I never had nothing to, to really wear. Greg got his own place as a teenager, but says he never missed a day checking in on his mom. So it was unusual when she didn't pick up his calls for two days in January of 1991. When I got there, 
The doors were locked. The light was on in the bathroom. Our dog was going mad, screeching, crying. So I knew how to get into the house, so I went to the front, pushed up on the bottom corner of the window, went in. The dog led me right up the stairs to the bathroom, and when I got there, the door was locked. So I was banging on the door, no answer. And it was only those plastic doorknobs that you push in. So I gave it a good hit with my hand, and then that's when I found Mom. Eight days after the gruesome discovery of his mother, slashed and stabbed 53 times, 19-year-old Greg Parsons was charged with first-degree murder. He was convicted of second degree in 1994. Greg's lawyers launched and won an appeal, and he was released from jail while awaiting a new trial. It was four years before the second trial was coming up. I went back to school, I got an honors business diploma, tried to start a business. Greg and his girlfriend, Tina, tried to pretend their life wasn't on hold until the next trial. They got married and had their first son, Zachary. I said to him, no matter what, I'm always going to be by your side, whether it's, you know, living outside of a, of a federal prison, one day the truth will. I always had faith that one day the truth would, would, would come. The police and a jury believed that Greg murdered his mother. Was there ever a moment where you doubted his innocence? Never, not once. His wife, Tina, may have believed in his innocence. Police did not. Out on bail with occasional court dates, Greg says local officers made sure he never forgot that he was a convicted murderer. Police used to follow me. I had a gym on Black Marsh Road. There'd be two cruisers parked across the street, shining their lights in through my business. One day, Greg was smoking a joint behind his gym. Police just happened to be there, and Greg says the officers sicked their dog on him. So when we see the footage of you leaving the court with injured legs, it's from the dog attack, the dog police attack. dog attack. You believe that they saw a convicted killer out on the street and they were harassing you? They were torturing me. Torture me. Just before his second trial was to begin, the DNA evidence collected at the murder scene in 1991 was sent back for new and advanced testing. I was told before the DNA was sent off that there was a new type of testing, this mitochondrial testing that allowed for uh, minute pieces of DNA to be tested that couldn't be tested before. Darren Bent covered the Greg Parsons case from the first 911 call to the conviction in 1994. So I knew they were sending a number of items uh, back to the crime lab to be tested to find out, you know, what they showed. And then, out of the blue, Greg and Tina Parsons, with their now two-year-old son, Zachary, got an unexpected call from their lawyer. Greg was used to bad news, and so he feared the worst. This was like 8 o'clock in the morning. Get down to my office right away and bring your family with you. Click. What are you thinking? I cried. I cried my eyes out. I was in the shower crying. I walk into his office, he says, all over me, buddy. All over. He said, DNA came back. It's not you. We're in court this afternoon. And I'm like, I looked at Zach. I said, we're going to Disney World. I don't know. I expect a trumpet's blaring or, or something. Like, it was just like, it was just so surreal. It was like an out-of-body experience that, well, finally, finally, you know? The more sophisticated testing picked up an unknown person's DNA mixed in with Catherine Carroll's blood, clearing Greg, who, with his family by his side, took one final walk to the Supreme Court in St. John's, a vindicated man. Mr. Parsons, how are you feeling today? I'll let you know, Dan. <laughs> Four years after being convicted of killing his own mother, Greg Parsons received a formal apology from the Crown and celebrated with his wife, Tina, on the courthouse steps outside. I'm so proud of him, and I love you very much. I, it feels great, it feels good. We can finally, I mean, this has been going on for a long time, and uh, it was so good to hear. So good to hear. I think it was the right thing for him to do, and I'm pleased that they did, accept responsibility for 
basically eight years of torture. Is it enough? <sighs> it's a start. DNA proves that Greg Parsons did not kill his mother. It would also eventually prove who did. A new police investigation was launched. DNA was collected from 150 people in the community. And then an anonymous tip about Greg's childhood friend, Brian Doyle, the one who lived two doors away from the murder scene and had told police about the kill your parents tape. Kill your parents! <laughs> the song recorded during jam sessions in Greg's basement was a key piece of evidence that led to Greg's conviction. Brian Doyle was now living outside Toronto, and police there started a surveillance operation and scooped up a cigarette butt that Brian Doyle had flicked onto the road. It came back a partial match, enough to bring Doyle in for questioning. I got to you know, got my mom. That you caught that on Mr. Carroll. What evidence do you have? Lead investigator Bob Johnson traveled from St. John's to Ontario. He had science on his side with a DNA match linking Brian Doyle to the murder scene, and now he wanted a confession. Was it your intention to go over and kill Mrs. Carroll on January 1st, 1991? I had no intention of killing anybody that day. I appreciate your honesty. The conversation went back and forth for hours. And then Brian Doyle revealed the chilling details of just what he did. He went in through this window in the basement, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, went upstairs, and took off his clothes. When she looked, she said it was me. She called me deep. I went into the washroom. That's actually that mess. Catherine Carroll was slashed and stabbed 53 times. Brian Doyle tells police that while she lay bleeding to death, he stepped over her and took a shower. And then from there, after you, you got a shower, do you remember what you dried yourself off with? I can't remember if I did or not. Maybe I just jumped out, put my little on okay. Brian Doyle calmly admitting to killing his friend's mother and letting Greg Parsons take the blame for years. I was just so floored. I was so betrayed. This Brian Doyle, he was the weak child in the neighborhood and there'd be feuds between neighborhoods and I protected him more times and I just felt so betrayed. When you heard the name Brian Doyle, what did you think? Had he crossed your mind as something? No. Never even crossed your mind? No. No, not once. And then things started to click. And he was right under our nose that whole time. He was at the funeral home. It was closed casket because of the damage he had done to her. It's the ultimate betrayal. Close friend murders your mother and leaves you holding the bag, leaves you to hang, you know, uh, and goes away for years knowing what's happening. Uh, I can't imagine what that's like. It's unthinkable on so many levels. Reporter Darren Bent was at the airport in St. John's when Brian Doyle was flown from Ontario to face justice. How do you feel about being arrested, Mr. Doyle? Well, they shuffled him through about 10 or 15 police officers. You couldn't really see him. Excuse me. Got him out through the airport. This is regular airport. Move right over, move right over. Put him in a car, and away they went. Police went directly to Greg Parson's mother's house at 16 James Place, where Brian Doyle calmly told them about the moments before the murder. When I got there, a uh, dog approached me, and I just, I guess you could say, I fooled around with the yeah. dog for a bit and that, that woke her up. I remember her saying, what are you doing here, Greg? And she left, and before she left, she knew it was me, told me to leave. They went to Greg Parsons' mother's home, and he walked them through the process, out around the house, and showed them where he had uh, gotten rid of the murder weapon. 
In this extraordinary police video, Doyle takes Detective Robert Johnson to the exact spot where he ditched the knife that was used to kill Catherine Carroll. Okay. How far inside the fence would you have We just take it, drop it over the fence. Uh, just, just went over the fence. That fence is just a two minute walk from the house where Greg's mother was murdered, an area police never even bothered to search. 12 years later, the weapon was still there. Greg Parsons has kept every last shred of evidence of his decades-long nightmare. So this is an evidence map. As you can see, here's mom's house right here. The murder weapon was found right here. Amongst the photos and files, this wedding guest book from the day Greg and Tina got married seems out of place. Brian Doyle was one of the visitors to our wedding. He was actually the last person to sign the, the guest book. At the time of your wedding, technically you were a convicted murderer, but the real murderer came and signed his name. And came and signed his name. Brian Doyle. Hi, hi, hi. Bye, bye. What do you think he meant here? He meant bye, bye. You're going to go, end up going to jail is what he meant. Looking back at it now with 2020 vision, seeing the whole scope of it. On June the 8th, 2001, an information was laid on a charge of first-degree murder against Brian Joseph Doyle, a former resident of St. John's, regarding the death of Catherine Carroll. First degree, the same charge filed against Greg Parsons just eight days after he discovered his mother, brutalized in her bathroom in 1991. Brian Doyle's first court appearance was at the same building where Greg was found guilty and then exonerated so many years before. Greg and Tina went to that court appearance. They needed to look the killer, once a friend, right in the eyes. I still can't wrap my head around the fact that somebody could be so cold-blooded. And the betrayal of it was just, I still to this day, I can't, I can't wrap my head around that type of evil. That, that's just, I can't, I can't. Behind closed doors at the courthouse, a deal was reached. That first degree charge knocked down to second degree in exchange for a guilty plea. There would be no trial. Just people still to this day don't know an arrest was made because he was in and out of court in five days with a plea bargain. Greg had a five month trial on the news every single day. Coming up. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe what I'm looking at here. A chaotic investigation and a questionable confession. I'm gonna keep it busy, keep the cops busy for at least a couple of months. When W5 continues. Welcome back. It's been three decades since Greg Parsons was wrongfully convicted of murdering his own mother. And all these years later, he just can't let go of the fact that the real killer, charged with first degree murder, was allowed to avoid a trial by pleading guilty to a lesser charge. Avenging his mother's death has become Greg Parsons' life mission. It's just so overwhelming. For decades, he has been consumed by the circumstances that led to his wrongful conviction. I'm looking at boxes and boxes of evidence. But he also can't let go of what he sees as another failure of the justice system. The plea deal offered to the real killer, Brian Doyle, in 2003. Second degree murder, life in prison with no chance of parole for 18 years. 11 years after the sentencing, the police officer who put Brian Doyle behind bars gave Greg Parsons evidence that would change his life yet again. I got a call from the lead investigator, Bob Johnson, and he told me to come down to the RNC. It was a few years before he passed away uh, due to uh, brain cancer, God bless him. And he said, Greg, you're gonna wanna look at this stuff. This stuff was a video file that police had secretly recorded of Brian Doyle before he was arrested. Video Greg didn't watch until Brian Doyle's first parole hearing just a number of years ago. I didn't go right home and watch it. 
And then I was amazed when this first hearing came up, this first parole hearing four years ago. And I started to get into it. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe what I'm looking at here. What he was looking at is this. Come on, my friend, have a seat beside me. We'll have a chat. That's Brian Doyle in the white sweater. He's being secretly taped by police before his arrest in 2002. It turns out that even though they had DNA from the cigarette butt, police wanted an airtight case before charging Brian Doyle. And so they staged an elaborate undercover operation, commonly referred to as a Mr. Big Sting. Okay, it's okay. here? Yeah. Doyle thinks he's meeting a kingpin looking to recruit new members for his organized crime operation. A good life coming up. And has no idea that this man is actually a police officer and that the entire conversation is being recorded. I've been a good boy all my life in Canada. And I will see you. <laughs> well, I, I've been a good boy as far, as far as the eyes of the law. Uh, as far as I could see. Exactly. The fake crime kingpin is talking to Brian Doyle about carrying out a hit against a woman. Doyle, who is tempted by a big payday, agrees to do it. I can put her trust and get in bed with her and strangle her. And he comes up with a plan for how to pin the crime on a neighbor. I was caught in my tracks is even before I approached the house or approached her, it's take a wander the neighboring houses, see if I can pick up off the ground the neighbor's fingerprints. When I do decide to do it, that goes into the scene of crime. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the busy, keep the cops busy for at least a couple of months. They're just gonna with the other shit out. Exactly. Hmm. They're gonna find this at the scene of crime with the neighbor's fingerprints. They're gonna hound him for months. The undercover cop says first he needs Doyle to share a secret to prove that he can do the job. Doyle reveals that he has murdered before and got away with it. Um, the law tells you you could never get away with murder. Life tells you if you plan it right, shit happens. He tells the undercover officer how he left a New Year's Eve party in 1991, wearing shoes that were not his, that he killed his friend's mother and then went back to the party to crash. So you left the New Year's Eve party? Round one or two. Whatever Greg's mom did the dirty deed. Shit happened. Shit happened. Went back, passed out in that basement. In many ways, watching this video has has really imprisoned you even more. It has, uh, because I can't get clear of it. Nothing means more to me now than getting the truth of this case out to the public. Greg watched that video showing his once best friend describing the murder scene and the sounds of his mother taking her last gasp. On the window, the door, the floor, and the floor, and the wall, and then what? Just blood. Until that last bit of hair coming up. I knew. So you didn't leave until she was dead. Exactly. Doyle says he felt no remorse. So what you feel when you're doing that? That's my question. You pissed me off? Let's do it. Not done. You felt nothing? Not done. How'd you feel when Greg got f***ing out? Great. You had a transcription of the Mr. Big Sting. It's all right here. It's all right here, four and a half hours. All of these little markers that you've put here are pieces of evidence that you say prove he planned this and he went looking for alibis. Absolutely. Greg and his wife Tina say when Brian Doyle was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of second degree murder, the undercover sting was not aired in court, so key details weren't taken into consideration. This was first degree murder, plain and simple. I, I still don't understand how they could have accepted second degree when he showed them where the murder weapon was, when he confessed, he had the DNA. And they said, we have no uh, guarantee of a conviction if it goes to trial. 
Well, boy, that's on you. That's on your skills as a crown prosecutor. If you can't get a conviction when you got DNA, I mean, you got a conviction on an innocent man with no hair, fire, nothing. And you're saying you can't get a conviction on first degree with all of this evidence. Like, it don't make sense. Tina says when the prospect of a plea deal was presented to them at Brian Doyle's trial in 2003, they were tricked into supporting it. If you don't go ahead with this, you're going to have to go through a trial again. You're going to go on trial all over again. But don't worry, because he's still going to get life in prison. And because of the severity of his crime, he'll never get out. So we were misled and intimidated and threatened. But they weren't worried about Greg going on trial again. They were worried about themselves going on trial. I believe that they wanted Brian Doyle gone as quickly as possible because he was the face of their mistake. Huge mistake. And they didn't want any more attention brought to how much money and resources they put into trying to put an innocent man behind bars for the rest of his life. Coming up. His job now is to keep people safe. Carrying on for the sake of others. And I'm not gonna stop until justice is done for my mother. When W5 continues. Greg Parsons and his wife, Tina, have weathered a three decades long storm. Not only did he lose his mother to murder, but he was charged and wrongfully convicted before being exonerated by DNA evidence. Theirs is as much a love story as it is a horror story. We first met at Burger King. She was an older woman, I was 16, she was 19, so I didn't think that she would ever have interest in a younger man. Their romance was just beginning when Greg made this frantic 911 call in the early days of 1991. He was just 19, Tina 22. They've been at each other's side as well after the shocking discovery that it was his one-time best friend who committed the crime. Still hurt after all these years to see him go through so much pain. And the anger and the hate, just watching it eat away at him. It's, it's like a cancer that, you know, it's just eating away at his goodness. And he's such a good person. I said, boy, if you could only see yourself through my eyes. <sighs> the support system extends beyond a devoted wife. OK, defib pads. Do we got three? Yep. That little boy who used to walk into court with mom and dad is now all grown up. Three small BVMs. Yeah. Zach is 28 yeah. and working shoulder to shoulder with his dad as a firefighter in St. John's. You know, I look at you and I look at the archival footage of you as a little boy being born at the most extraordinarily difficult moment of your family's life. Yeah, absolutely, it was difficult. Dad wasn't acquitted until I was four or five years old. Then it took a toll from our family, but my parents did such a great job is something that never defined my childhood. The opportunities that my parents gave me is what made me who I am today, and eternally grateful for that, so, yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask you what kind of a role model your dad has been for you? Oh, a tremendous role model. Like, this is why I'm wearing the uniform today, right? So, a uh, tremendous role model. I hope that I can give, um, when I have children someday, that I can give them half as much of a life that my dad has given to me. Greg has been a firefighter in St. John's for more than two decades now, eventually working his way up to lieutenant, and recently he was honored as Firefighter of the Year. The irony is not lost on the man who covered his three-decade-long legal journey. Greg Parsons is a celebrated member of our community now. He's been uh, recognized for, you know, the work he does with the fire department. Darren Bent covered the Parsons saga from day one. He's maybe one of the best trained people that we have. His job now is to keep people safe, you know. There's an irony. 
the fire hall itself is just a stone's throw away from the police station, where Greg had to sign in every day while out on bail before being exonerated. There's nights now that Tina will tell me, I wake up in, in tears saying, I just I got to sign in. Even now, Greg? Even now. I, I have night terrors. Men that work with me in the fire hall know it. My wife knows it. There's no headboard over my bed. There's holes in the wall for me, night terror sleeping, hitting, lashing out. In those night terrors where you're, you're afraid that you haven't signed in, what else is in those terrors? See a man there, finding man, being sentenced to jail. As part of a plea bargain, Brian Doyle was sentenced to a minimum of 18 years in jail. He's never fully explained just why he killed Catherine Carroll. Combing through court documents, his police confession, and undercover police video, his story bounces from blaming drugs and booze to wanting to free Greg from an abusive mother to a flat-out hatred for Greg. Me and Greg, best friends in the family met. But the last couple of years, all it was was him thinking he was the big shot among all the local friends. Yeah. Doyle spent the first seven years in maximum security before being transferred to William Head, a minimum security facility in BC. It's club fed. It's a minimum security prison on the west coast of Canada, BC. Beautiful. Somewhere where we should be putting our veterans or our elderly people. This is where he is. Doyle was granted day parole in 2020. But a year later, that parole was revoked, thanks in large measure to Greg's victim impact statement and evidence he presented that he says proves Doyle should have been convicted of first degree murder. What's your fear for society if Brian gets released? I fear for the world because uh, he's a manipulative, he's a pathological liar. Like, he has not been rehabilitated. That's what I'm trying to say. He never got properly punished for his crime. I could bet the firm on it. He's not going to be out for more than a year, and he'll be back in. And I hope it's not for murder or rape. I don't want to be the person to say, I told you so. Have you prepared yourself for his release? I know, I know it's going to happen, and I know um, I have, and uh, he knows that he can't come back here. He's already agreed that there's nothing in Newfoundland for him, so um, I know he's not going to come back here, but I, it worries me for the safety of others because, it, you know, what he did, um, it's a sick, sick mind, and, uh, and not being properly punished for something, you know, like that, uh, you know, what, what will he do next? Who know? That scares you? It scares me for, for other people, sure. Greg and Tina have tried to move on. I'm not Greg Parsons, the victim. I'm no longer the victim. I survived this with my family. I'm Greg Parsons, the son of a murdered mother, Catherine Carroll, and I'm not going to stop until justice is done for my mother. And if justice means just getting the truth out and showing the people of Canada and the US what a danger he is when he gets out, that's enough. I'm done with this, I can't do this anymore. But I won't stop. I don't care if it costs me my sanity. In August of 2022, at a parole board hearing, Brian Doyle, for the very first time, admitted a sexual motivation for the murder of Catherine Carroll. He says just before his attack, she had rejected him sexually. This is an issue that was never taken into consideration when Doyle was given his plea deal.